My name is Dr. Daniel Fox, and I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Texas, an expert in the area of personality disorders. And today I wanted to make a video on the myths and misunderstandings of borderline personality disorder. And the reason why I, want to, I wanted to do this video is because a lot of folks have been writing me and saying, well, how can I explain to loved ones and family members what borderline personality disorder is and what they're experiencing? And I thought that a video on clarifying this would, would really help. Uh, another uh, incident that, that occurred was, was just the other day is that a client of mine that uh, she has Bell's palsy and what happened was is that she started to have um, sort of uh, facial droops and, and things like that and, and her family was, was very supportive of the Bell's palsy and the, and the facial droops and, and th things like that but when it came to the personality disorder aspect um, they were a little dismissive and I think a lot of it is that we're, we're trying to educate the family on what is what is going on what is borderline personality disorder because just as the client has difficulty controlling the Bell's palsy there's also a difficulty controlling the borderline personality disorder so I think that support for both avenues is, is really really important okay um, and the particular client was, was aware. I said, oh, this would be a really good example for a video. And she said, that's fine. Uh, go ahead, you know, if you want to talk about the Bell's palsy and borderline personality disorder. So, um, so she was okay with me mentioning that. I would never uh, mention anything about, uh, even though I don't identify the, the client, I would never um, want to mention an, an issue with one of my clients without them giving me the okay first. That's important to do. So let's talk about what is the criteria? What makes up borderline personality disorder? I'm not going to go through the, uh, the DSM-5. So if you're a family member, a loved one, or perhaps you're wondering if you have borderline personality disorder, this video will help you too to sort of identify, say, yeah, that kind of fits, and then, and then we'll go through 10 facts related to personality disorder and uh, to borderline personality disorder. And then at the end, uh, I'm gonna tell you about a really amazing uh, research study that should give folks a lot of hope Okay, so let's kind of start out. What is borderline personality disorder? And we're going to pull this criteria from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, so the DSM. And what we're going to do, though, we're not going to go through the list of all nine. What I did is instead I broke them up into four different categories. Okay, so this first category is called interpersonal dysregulation. And what that means is that it's difficulty kind of interacting with others, right? Difficulty in relationships. And... So individuals with borderline personality disorder, they have a lot of abandonment fears. It's a fear of losing the ones that they love and care about. And you may think, well, even in short term, like if you meet somebody, if someone with borderline personality disorder meets somebody and they think that they're neat or they, they really like them or they click, um, individuals with borderline personality disorder are really quick to uh, jump in to, to relationships, to connect very quickly. And as they connect, even though they're quick to do that, there's also that fear of abandonment, of losing that connection. So they have these abandonment fears. Now there's also, which is very common, is these unstable relationships. Now if you've been in a relationship, or perhaps your, your loved one, brother, sister, cousin, uh, spouse, has borderline personality disorder, then you know what I mean by unstable relationships. And a lot of times in these relationships, we go from an idealization to a devaluation, right? So you kind of go to those, or you experience those, those extremes that that individual that has borderline personality disorder sees you as a hero, but then you're quickly a zero. And sometimes, it's that you didn't do anything. It's just that, or seemingly you didn't do anything or it wasn't purposeful, but it, it's their perception and it's dealing with these perceptions which can change because there's more than one thing going on, right? Think about our lives. How often do we have just one thing going on? We, we never do. So all of these factors, and when you have borderline personality disorder, um, it, it's hard to interpret and we're gonna talk about those things, self-dysregulation in just a little bit. Um, so it's difficulty to interpret and that, that impairment in interpretation really negatively impacts these relationships. Okay, so it's important to recognize that these folks have unstable relationships. And then individuals with borderline personality disorder, they experience a lot of emptiness. Okay? So even though they can be in a crowded room and even though uh, if you're a significant other you care a lot about this individual, they still have this sense of emptiness. So it's a hole that is that uh, is hard to fill, or that isn't filled, obviously, because it's empty. And this emptiness, 
as much as the individual with borderline personality disorder tries to fill it, sometimes with material goods, with sex, gambling, drugs, other types of issues, uh, self-harm, um, that it doesn't fill that emptiness because of that difficulty of self-dysregulation, um, affective and emotional dysregulation, so these other components. And all of these things are going on at the same time, right? So when all of these things are going on at the same time, it's very chaotic. And it's hard for them to develop this sense of self and feel a sense of fullness with their emotions and their connection with others and their loved ones. So they have a sense of emptiness. And so the next section we're gonna talk about is effective emotion dysregulation. So effective and emotional dysregulation. And here we're talking about emotional um, instability, effective instability. And you see that there's erratic mood swings a lot of times, difficulty controlling their mood. It seems like that, um, and from the outside as a family member, I think a lot of times you're like, well, everything sets him or her off. Everything gets them going. Everything gets them angry. Everything gets them upset. Everything gets them crying. Everything gets them wanting to hurt themselves or drug binges or sex binges or whatever it may be. And, you know, it, that's part of that borderline personality disorder issue is that effective instability, those emotions. Those emotions are out of control. Now imagine that you have emotions that are out of control paired with a sense of emptiness, right? So you don't feel full. You're also afraid of losing the ones whom you care about. And that impacts the relationships that are so important to keep you connected, where maybe it gives you a sense of connection or fullness, but not enough to fill the emptiness. And if this is confusing, this is how a lot of folks with borderline personality disorder see the world, okay? Um, another effective and emotional, or experience the world rather than, than, than just see it. And effective emotional dysregulation, another component is inappropriate and intense anger, right? So a lot of times they get set off really quick. And you may think, well, I didn't do anything. I didn't say anything. I didn't, you know, I responded to the text. I was stuck in traffic or my, my phone died and I wasn't able to, you know, call him or her back. And now they're angry and they're screaming at me or, you know, they've locked me out of the house, thrown all my clothes onto the, um, onto the lawn and stuff like that. And, and, you know, so this intense and appropriate anger is part of that borderline personality disorder. Now, none of these things we're saying is excusing behaviors. All we're doing is identifying behaviors and identifying the issues. Because I think just as we want to understand like uh, an issue such as Bell's palsy, we want to understand borderline personality disorder too. So we just want to build that understanding, okay? We're not saying, well, it's there, so you have to accept it. But what we want to do is if, if your loved one had Bell's palsy, you would probably want to help that person. If your person, if this individual has borderline personality disorder, you know you want to help them too, right? And you want to help them as much as you can, and you're able to. But you also uh, want to help your borderline personality disorder as much as you're able to, okay? And we'll, we'll, I'll talk briefly about boundaries in, in just a second, especially with with loved ones and things like that. Okay. So the next section we're going to talk about is behavioral dysregulation. Now. Behavioral dysregulation is really common, and this is individuals with borderline personality disorder, of course, have recurrent suicidality, threats, self-harm, things like that, and a lot of times so they're triggered, and what happens is, is the sense of being overwhelmed. Now, there's a lot of reasons why folks self-harm, and we're not going to go into that today, um, or have... Um, you know, individuals with borderline personality disorder are at a, a higher risk than those in the general population, people who don't have borderline personality disorder, um, to complete suicide. So it's something we have to take very seriously. Even if you have someone who makes a lot of suicidal threats, it's things that are important and that we, we take those seriously. Okay? Uh, and then also with borderline personality disorder, we have impulsivity. And this impulsivity, you see it in, um, in sex, with promiscuity, you see it with driving, uh, someone driving intoxicated, uh, driving drugged, um, sometimes binging, binge eating, uh, binging behaviors, things like that. So this behavioral dysregulation is a big component as well in those that have borderline personality disorder. And then this last component we're gonna talk about is called self-dysregulation. Okay. Now these are unstable and distorted self-image. And imagine if, if you went into like those hall of mirrors, if you've ever been in one of those, like a fun house, you know, and all those mirrors, and you try to see where you are, and sometimes they're distorted, right? They have the little cracks in them and it's hard to see everything. But imagine if you're not in a fun house, but it's your life. 
And sometimes that's what it's like for folks with borderline personality disorder, is that they're in this shattered, um, mirrored existence, and it's hard for them to identify where they are, who they are, uh, their vocational aspects or aspirations, and their their love interests and what they want out of life, and their goals and things, and they tend to be very variable. Um, and you know, so it's very, very confusing. So a lot of times they're they're really confused about themselves and, and who they are, and it changes a lot. So a lot of family members sometimes get frustrated. They get frustrated um, because these individuals they may change jobs a lot, they may change interests a lot, and the family gets frustrated because this can of course cause um, you know poor economics. They have difficulty paying their bills, you know, other types of issues, and the family gets frustrated. Say, I'm tired of paying your bills because you're always switching jobs or you're losing jobs because of the temp. Temperament. Remember, each of these components don't occur in a vacuum, that they all occur together. Now, different ones, not everybody with borderline personality disorder has all nine of these criteria, right? But if, if this individual qualifies for borderline personality disorder, they have many of them, five or more, occurring at the same time. So there's a lot going on at any given time for these individuals and they're trying to manage it, trying to balance it, and it's really, really hard. And we know for loved ones and people who care about them that it's hard to watch them go through this and that's certainly understandable. Um, and you know that's why mental health providers are so important, but we're I'm digressing a little bit. I wanna go back to that last self uh, dysregulation component, which is the sense of depersonalization, paranoid, um, uh, ideation under stress. So when we talk about depersonalization, that's just losing your sense of who you are, like dissociating to a degree. Um, and if you want to learn more, if you're a loved one who said, well, I think that my partner or loved one or child or someone, you know, goes through this, uh, I made a video about uh, dissociation that might help you and so you could learn a little bit about it as well. And this paranoid ideation under stress. So stress increases Right? And that could be a whole host of reasons because we know individuals with borderline personality disorder are easily triggered in many cases. So this paranoid ideation, so the stress increases and it causes this paranoid ideation. Okay? Now let's say, okay, let me give you an example. So let's say that stress increases. Now maybe it's a relational stress, but this individual already holds the idea that their loved one is going to leave them. They have the sense of emptiness, but they need their loved one in order to feel full. But their stress is increasing because they think because they didn't get responded to in a text in appropriate time, or they didn't get a call when they were supposed to, or the individual didn't come home when they were supposed to, or a whole host of things. So the stress increases. This individual, the individual borderline personality disorder, thinks that the person that they're in love with or kid that they care about is going to leave them. So then they have that abandonment fear, but they hold this sense of emptiness. So that abandonment will kick off the, the emptiness as well. So that causes that unstable relationship. And that unstable relationship is further unstable because of the affective and emotion dysregulation. Okay? And that affective instability, so the individual's borderline personality disorder, already under an increased stress, paranoia is kicked up. Paranoia, they're going to lose their loved one, trying to fill that emptiness. Of course, that abandonment is directly attached to that emptiness. Okay? But the affective instability of their emotions, they can't get under control. So what do they do? They engage in behavioral dysregulation, which is self-harm, hurting themselves, acting out, promiscuity, gambling, things like this. Now. For individuals that have borderline personality disorder, for me to tell that story about what I just said, they're like, yeah, I know what that's like. When I tell family members, loved ones, significant others, they're like, what the heck did you just say? What? I couldn't follow you. You're all over the place. That's right, because it's hard. It's hard to understand that because there is so much going on at the, at the same time. And that's why therapy is so important because it, therapy can provide that groundwork, that foundation for understanding what's going on with your loved one, your child, um, you know, your significant other, whatever it may be. But what I want to do is now that we kind of painted this picture of what borderline personality disorder is, let me give you some facts about it because often people really misunderstand what borderline personality disorder is and they carry all these myths. Society has a lot of myths about what borderline personality disorder is. Okay, So let's go over those now. So the first fact that I want to give you is that borderline personality disorder is environmentally induced. Now what does that mean? That means that there's something in the environment, some trigger, 
that tends to set them off, right? That occurs. Now, the example that I just gave just a moment ago was that in the individual in the example was that they were waiting for a text or the expectation of a text they didn't get on time or the person didn't come home on time or, you know, uh, they didn't get a call that they expected, whatever it was. So there's something in the environment that sets them off. Now, a lot of times individuals with borderline personality sort of have trouble identifying their triggers, identifying those things, their emotional buttons um, and those triggers. And I also did a video on emotional buttons as well. If you're interested in that, uh, you can learn more about that. And um, so that it is environmentally induced. There's something that kicks it off. Okay, now it could be something very minor because it depends upon where they are. Not everyone with borderline personality disorder is the same. All right. Not everyone with borderline personality disorder has the extremes of emotions, severity of emotions, the moderates of emotions, just with Bell's palsy. It's very different for my client based upon where she is on that spectrum and the borderline personality disorder individual and where they are on that spectrum. So it's, it's, it's two very, very different things. So the first fact I want to remind you again is that, that borderline personality disorder is environmentally induced, that there's something out there that kicks it off. Now, number two that we're going to talk about is that Borderline personality disorder is not a choice. Is it a lot of times, you know, um, I hear family members saying, well, he or she is choosing to act that way. It's really not, not a choice. Now that doesn't mean that their behavior should be, lack of a better word, um, not necessarily accepted. I don't like that word accepted, but is that I think it needs to be understood. I don't think that, um, then we have to say, okay, you know, then that's okay. You can treat me this way. I think everybody should be treated with, with respect and we should treat ourselves with respect, but that that's hard for individuals with borderline personality disorder. And it's, and it's important that we understand that, that these are folks that are struggling. That's why treatment is so important. Continual treatment is so important. And that there are some things, um, to feel good about. And we're going to talk more about those as well. Okay. So, um, the second fact is that um, individuals do not choose to have borderline personality. It's not a choice. It's not like, oh, well, she's choosing, he or she is choosing to be this way. Okay. Um, an important component, and this relates to the research I'm going to talk about at the end, is that recovery is possible and likely. Okay. There's been a lot of research done on borderline personality disorder. There's been a lot of effective treatment on borderline personality disorder. We understand so much more about it than we did in the 80s. In the 80s is when this myth of of the Glenn Close fatal attraction character, uh, that, that that's what borderline personality disorder is. That's so far from the truth. Hollywood is not a good place to get uh, mental health data. Uh, a lot of folks do that. They believe, oh, it's a good movie, so it must be factual. That's absolutely not true, especially in the case of borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is not a source of entertainment. And I think that um, Hollywood, of course, wants to use everything as a source of entertainment, but real life is very different. And that, that, that's what I meant by that comment. Um, hey, now number three, now, now the number three was that recovery is very possible and it's also likely. Again, we'll talk about the research too. Now number four, the fact is that after two years, more than 50% of individuals with BPD recover. 50%. Okay. So what that means is that these individuals, they develop positive psychosocial uh, behaviors, right? That they develop strategies that they can learn to manage their emotions, identify their triggers and function effectively. Okay. So that's 50% of individuals with borderline personality disorder, right? Do recover. The next is after 10 years, more than 80% of individuals with borderline personality disorder recover 80%. Okay. Now that is amazing. That is really good. But what happens is so many people, they get focused on this idea, well, they don't recover or um, for the ones that do, they say, see, well, that was a phase for him or her or something like that. And they discount, well, that probably wasn't borderline personality disorder. And when we say recovery, what we mean is that we, it's a lot like alcoholism, is that we build these strategies so that we can avoid the trouble right, that we experience with borderline personality disorder. Um, I've been very fortunate in working with a number of, of individuals that have really um, experienced a lot with, with borderline personality disorder and struggles and issues. And fortunately, we were able to work together for a very, very long time, about three years. Um, and after those three years, if you were to meet these individuals, you wouldn't know they had borderline personality disorder. Um, and I've, I've never asked any of them. They've, they've since gone on and, and uh, are out living their lives. but. I wonder if, if they would still say, yes, I have borderline personality disorders just under control. A lot like, like alcoholics. A lot of alcoholics say, well, I'm an alcoholic. 
Do I have to be aware of the issues that I'm contending with? Um, and remember that I said that they have borderline personalities, not that they are borderline. That's two totally different things. Having it and being it are two different things because I don't think people are borderline personality disorder. I think that they have it. And if you have it, then you can manage it and you can, uh, we can get you into recovery. And 88% remain in recovery. That means that they're still engaging in treatment. They're still taking care of themselves. They're still doing things that they need to do. They're building those strategies, using those strategies, and managing those strategies. And it takes time. It takes time to do it. Okay? Now, the next, the sixth fact, that I want to tell you about is that 40% of individuals with borderline personality disorder were previously diagnosed with bipolar disorder and 25% of individuals have both. Now I've recently done a video on bipolar disorder so and there is a lot of confusion even in the experts in the field that uh, in experts with borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder and there is a lot of confusion about the two and especially when they overlap so um, if you think that you may have both, your loved one may have both. Uh, it's important that you can check out that video. Maybe that'll help clarify some things as well. It's very, very confusing, these two disorders, okay? Now, the next fact is that borderline personality disorder is underdiagnosed, misunderstood, and overstigmatized, okay? Now, everything I'm telling you today is, is out from, from the research. This is what the experts in the field, so I pull all of this data together, and the experts know that it is underdiagnosed, so we're not accurately identifying it. Okay? We still overdiagnose it in females, underdiagnose it in males, because when males tend to show borderline personality disorder features, we misdiagnose them with antisocial behaviors. When, in, when uh, females tend to show antisocial behaviors, we misdiagnose them with borderline personality disorder. Okay? And that could be a video all, all on its own, God knows. Okay, but we're gonna, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna stay with the point of what we're talking about here. Now, number nine is that the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder is often withheld from patients and families. This is something that I, um, I don't, I'm not a big diagnosis person. And you might be like, what? Well, and the reason why I'm not is that I worry about carrying badges of diagnoses. And so with, with my clients, some of them will say, well, what did you diagnose me with? And a lot of them come to me. I mean, obviously, you know, um, my area is personality disorder. So, and now with, um, with Wikipedia and, you know, all the, with the internet and all this other stuff is that people can look it up and they can get a pretty good idea. Well, I think I have this, I think I da da da. And then they come in and they say, hey, I need, you know, confirmation or I need clarity or I think I have this or whatever. But the, the concern is, and I, I tell my clients this, is that my concern is, is that when you start to define yourself by the diagnosis, that goes back to what I said a moment ago, that I am borderline. I never want to hear a client say that because that's, that, that makes it part of who you are. And I know it feels that way. But by saying that you have borderline personality disorder, okay, means that it's a, it's a part that can be treated, right? It's a component that can be treated. It's something that you're experiencing, but we can treat it, lessen it, right? Minimize its impact. That is possible to do that. And we know that. We just talked about, about the data. 88%, okay, are in recovery, and that's great, okay? But, so I think sometimes it's withheld. I think that a lot of mental health providers, psychiatrists, uh, general practitioners, uh, whoever it may be, that a lot of them are like, well, I don't want to tell them that they're borderline. They'll freak out. Uh, I think now with the internet, I don't think a lot of people are surprised, um, but I don't think that diagnosis is the end all be all. I think treatment, the purpose of diagnosis is so that other professionals can communicate and identify a course of treatment. That's, that's really the point of it. Um, it's not to identify or carry a badge and say, you know, we'll see it's borderline. It wasn't me, it was my, it was my borderline. And, um, so I think that that's why a lot of folks are reluctant um, and that the diagnosis is, is withheld. I think that that happens a lot too. Um, but again, I, I do have this discussion with my clients, the ones who really, really wanna know. Um, so uh, that is number nine. And the last one is that borderline personality disorder is actually considered a good prognosis diagnosis, okay? These are the experts in the field, okay? And they're saying that this is a disorder, once identified, we can get these folks in treatment and they will have remissions, which is when we hit remissions is that you are not symptomatic at that time, okay? And that you're going along just fine. Now that doesn't mean that it won't experience a stressor or a trauma or something and then you may revert back to the old default negative beliefs, behaviors, and patterns, which is borderline personality disorder. And then maybe you go back 
five steps, four steps. But if you're 15 steps ahead, you're not going back to the start, but it might feel that way, but you're not because you can kick in those helpful strategies and you kick up those helpful strategies that helps you keep going and you can do it. It is possible to do it. I assure you of that. Okay. What does all this mean? That means treatment is important staying in treatment, identifying treatment, okay? Finding the strategies that work for you. And if you can do that, that it is possible. If you have borderline personality disorder, borderline personality disorder traits, and that these, these issues become expressed, that you are not doomed to experience this forever, is that treatment is important. Having the volition to engage in treatment and do things differently is important and you can do it and the data is there that says it is possible to do it, that it is possible to decrease, attenuate borderline personality disorder symptoms, all the stuff that I talked about in the beginning. This is a good prognosis diagnosis. This is something that can be managed with proper treatment, okay? And it is possible to do that. Right? Uh, I hope that, that you have found this helpful. If, if you're a loved one, please understand that um, encouraging folks to get help and, and having a lot of patience, I know sometimes it be important for you to have moments where you can you know, revitalize yourself and, and be able to take care of yourself. You can't take care of anyone else if you can't take care of yourself. And it's, it's important to take care of yourself too. And so, uh, but remember that this is a disorder that, that can be managed and, and it, I think it should be seen um, as a good prognosis diagnosis. Okay, I hope that this was helpful for you. Um, thank you very much. Any comments, please feel to leave uh, any comments below. If you like this, please check out my other videos. And if you like those, you're welcome to subscribe. And thank you very much for your time. I certainly appreciate it. And please be well. Thank you. Bye-bye.